Welcome to this online presentation of the Hotel Energy Efficiency Information Grant Program by the Australian Hotels Association and Tourism Accommodation Australia. It's part of the Energy Efficiency Information Project, which has received funding by the Commonwealth Department of Industry. This presentation is essentially a summary of the program and will explain the impact of rising energy costs on hotel finances, what initiatives can be introduced to help you save energy and money through the development of an energy management system, how behaviour change can lead to efficiencies and the advantages of getting staff, guests and contractors on board, specific heating, ventilation and cooling system and lighting energy efficiencies to help you save money. The program has been specially designed to provide information on how to reduce energy use to the hotel and accommodation sector. A preliminary audit of 17 member venues was done to understand where and how energy is used. Much of the information gathered from that audit is used in the program. The audit also led to the development of eight guides to help you implement energy saving measures and they're also on this website. An energy efficiency induction manual has also been developed to inform management, operational staff and contractors of their roles and responsibilities to support energy saving measures. And a follow-up audit will be conducted at the end of the program as well. This will determine what measures have been actually implemented over the two-year program. The overall program consists of this website to host the guides, other reference materials and this presentation of energy efficiency information, case studies of leading practices and other success stories of member companies, articles in the AHA yearbook as well as other regular state-based publications and the annual Energy Efficiency Recognition Awards to be held on a state or territory and national basis. Take a look at this diagram. It shows that the average hotel energy use is spread relatively evenly between a number of areas, including kitchens, chillers, hot water heating, lighting and heating, cooling and ventilation. Let's break that energy use into electricity and gas. Typically, the majority of electricity is used in heating, cooling and ventilation, including fans, up to 35%. Chiller systems can use up to 27%, lighting can account for nearly 20% and refrigeration 6%. As you can see in this figure, gas is commonly used in kitchens for pool and hot water systems, space heating and laundries. Gas can also be used to run clothes dryers. If you use the percentages in these two figures and the amount of electricity and gas you use each year, you should be able to work out how much each area may be costing you. The following few slides show how much energy is commonly used by the hotel and accommodation sectors respectively. It can be seen in this graph that the spread of energy consumption per square metre is higher for accommodation venues than for hotels and there are some good reasons for this. Accommodation venues have a greater number of services, for example spas and pools. They have individual guest rooms that contain separate heating and cooling systems. They have a higher number of patrons at any given time. And the services are used for more hours per day. The highest energy consumption was found to be more common in northern Australia where air conditioners are keeping patrons and guests cool for more of the year. It can be seen in this slide that the Northern Territory consumes the most amount of energy per annum and this is due to the use of air conditioning systems. In relation to the cooler climates, gas is the main energy source for heating. Gas is more efficient than electricity for conditioning spaces. Apart from the sites in the Northern Territory, the highest consumption is in the sites located in Victoria, South Australia and Tasmania. The higher results in the southern states are mainly due to the age of the properties, inefficient equipment and poorly performing building spaces. Not surprisingly, accommodation venues spend more on their energy costs per year than hotels and this is due to the greater number of services and higher number of patrons at any given time and lower operating margins. 
the highest energy cost was found to be more common in the areas that didn't have access to natural gas, as LPG has a higher cost. Ignoring the result from the sites located in Tasmania, the remaining states, on average, are very similar and close to the average result of 3%. There were some variations from state to state due to different tariffs and individual prices paid to the retailers. As mentioned, a number of guides have been developed to help you save energy and money, and they're on this website. They cover energy efficiency in business planning, including the development of an energy management system, behaviour change, understanding bills and tariffs, energy efficient heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems, energy efficient lighting and other equipment, renovating and refurbishments and energy use, reducing resource use in your supply chain, and the AHA has also developed an induction manual to help you improve the roles of management, staff, patrons and guests and contractors in reducing energy use. Each guide has been prepared to help you understand about the energy management activity in question, for example, changing light globes, the value or importance of undertaking the efficiency measure, or what you'll get out of it, what could be costing you money through inefficient practices in the workplace, how to save money through smarter operations, longer term savings for improved control and more efficient equipment, and the roles of management, staff, patrons and guests and contractors in reducing energy use. Reducing your energy use is an increasingly important part of managing a hotel or accommodation business, but it's worth doing because you'll save money on energy bills, reduce your impact on the environment, enhance your corporate reputation for protecting the environment, gain better engagement with your staff, customers and service contractors, and reduce the need for costly government investment in energy infrastructure. By participating in the program, you'll learn how to achieve business-wide commitment to energy efficiency and how to communicate this to all staff, the role of management staff, patrons and guests and contractors in identifying and promoting energy saving measures, and you'll learn how to read and understand your energy bills and where and how you can reduce costs and save money. The program will also help you identify simple changes you can make to work procedures and practices, like setting the controls of your heating, ventilation and air conditioning or HVAC equipment so it operates more efficiently, ways of maintaining all your equipment like fridges, air conditioning and kitchen appliances to ensure they're working as efficiently as possible, lighting control and management, and efficient use and operations of other equipment. Getting actively involved in managing energy use in your business means you'll be able to save money, increase your profits and reduce carbon emissions. And you'll be able to make long-term savings by implementing an energy management system. Now, establishing an energy management system is the first and most important step in any approach to managing energy use. It's simply a logical approach to managing energy use. The five key elements to a successful energy management system are commitment, understanding, planning, implementation and management and monitoring. Energy management systems are explained in full in the Energy Efficiency and Business Planning Guide on this website. It's important to note at this point that management and staff commitment is the foundation of a successful energy management system. To establish energy management as a business priority, you need to have clear energy performance objectives, allocate sufficient resources and communicate your intent across the business. It's really important to keep employees and management up to date as a way of keeping the focus alive and driving for even better results. Introducing an energy management policy is one of the best ways to solidify your business intent in relation to energy use. Make sure you train and retrain staff on your policy and energy management system, especially to accommodate staff turnover. Make it part of your staff induction process and post a copy on your notice board, as you do with workplace health and safety policies. 
monitoring and reporting on energy use and costs is a vital part of this whole process. It will help you determine the value of the changes you've made. To identify the potential opportunities, you need to undertake an energy assessment. The findings from the assessment should help you develop an action plan. This plan should identify the energy saving opportunities and prioritise them according to payback periods, cost benefit or return on investment. Your plan should focus on low cost energy saving practices and procedures, but also include energy saving technologies such as upgrades, maintenance or other changes to plant and equipment. Now is a good opportunity to pause this presentation, go back to the website and download the Energy Efficiency and Business Planning Guide. Otherwise, stay online as we continue on to the next topic, behaviour change. People are responsible for introducing and supporting energy saving measures. So if you want to improve your energy efficiency, you have to convince your staff, contractors and customers to change their behaviour accordingly. To encourage people to change their behaviour, owners and managers need to take a focused approach to energy management, which will help you to reduce energy costs, which are rising substantially year on year, create a healthier working environment, making your business more productive and a potential employer of choice, and it will help you to enhance your social and environmental credentials, which can be marketed to customers and the community. But real and lasting change needs more than just good management and leadership. Staff also play an important and instrumental role. The way your staff behave and operate equipment has a direct impact on the energy consumed. For example, if your staff ensure lights are turned off in areas not in use, energy consumption will decrease. Patrons and guests can be motivated to help reduce energy as well. Have signs or stickers in rooms and bathrooms encouraging them to use less energy and explain the hotel's commitment to be energy efficient in the form of an energy management policy. Actively collecting feedback from guests will help you to build a picture of energy demand as well as bringing up any issues like lighting failures and drafts. It's good to ask contractors and service providers for feedback as well. They can identify areas where further efficiencies may be made. We'll now continue on to the next topic on understanding your energy bills and tariffs. As you'll see on the right hand side of this slide, we've reproduced a copy of a typical electricity bill. This is part of the front page. Now, although your bill might look slightly different, there are some important items common to the majority of energy bills you should understand. The first is the National Meter Identifier, NIMI for electricity, or Meter Installation Reference Number, MERN for gas. It's a unique number that identifies the metering at your address for billing purposes. Why is it useful? Well, some businesses may have more than one meter for separate areas. This is how you can tell which bill is for which part of your business. Having separate readings for different areas allows you to see what parts of your business are using the most amount of energy. The billing period is the period of time to which all charges on the bill relate. You'll need to know the billing or supply period to determine how much energy you use on average each day, week or month. Energy charges are the cost of the energy used by your business. And there's a number of other charges which may appear on your bill, like supply or distribution charges, which are the costs associated with transporting the energy to your business from the point of creation, from the power station, based on your usage, meter supply charges, and charges for emissions and renewable energy. The layout could vary from retailer to retailer, but generally this is where the various charges are itemised. There are some key things to know from your bill, like the cost of the energy. Energy has a different cost per unit at different times of the day, as reflected in your tariffs. If you don't know, your retailer will be able to tell you when the tariffs start and end. Knowing when you use energy, your peak demand and how that relates to your average demand is also important. Your energy use varies across the year and understanding this will put you in a better position to negotiate better rates with your retailer. To find out more about energy bills and tariffs, go back to the website and download the Understanding Energy Bills and Tariffs Guide. Otherwise, stay online as we continue on with heating, ventilation and air conditioning efficiencies. 
Your heating, ventilation and air conditioning or HVAC systems can account for approximately 23% of your energy use. Costs can be reduced by maintaining appropriate temperatures, for example setting heating and cooling to match occupancy levels and external climates. Adjusting when your systems turn on and off outside of building operating times and maintaining your HVAC system by cleaning dirty filters, evaporator and condenser coils, and ventilation ducts. You could be wasting energy in a number of areas. If heating and cooling systems are both operating at the same time, they effectively compete against each other. When system maintenance is not routinely undertaken, filters, evaporator and condenser coils, and ventilation ducts are dirty, and they don't work as well as they should. If you have poor shading or inefficient glass, your system operates excessively to condition areas that heat up in the afternoon. And conversely, the south and east rooms could get too cold and occupants use room heating to compensate. There's a lot you can do though to make your HVAC system work more efficiently. For example, only use heating and cooling at temperatures that suit the climate where you are. Lower your temperature set points, for example set heating to switch on at 18 degrees Celsius and cooling to switch on at 24. Only use heating and cooling when it's needed. Consider zoning areas so that they're only conditioned when they're occupied. Maintaining your HVAC system thermostats and ensuring that they're not affected by drafts, sunlight or heat sources should also help reduce costs. Let's take a quick look at a case study. Crown Plaza in Alice Springs. Through an audit, the hotel was able to identify areas where it could reduce the energy used by their HVAC system. Variable speed drives were installed, saving $20,000 a year. Controls were optimised to reduce unnecessary run times, and they ensured all the HVAC equipment was working together effectively. For more information on the Crown Plaza case study and what else you can do to improve the efficiency of your HVAC system, download the HVAC guide now or stay online to find out more about lighting. Lighting accounts for around 10% of the total energy used by pubs and hotels. Your lighting costs can be reduced by up to 50% by implementing lighting controls and efficient globes. Reducing the amount of energy used for lighting can be simple. Understand what lighting you have and what you need, such as ensuring areas are not overlit where you only need low lighting levels. Make sure you clean lamps and other light fixtures on a regular basis. This will increase the amount of light and reduce the amount of heat produced from dirty globes. Make the most of natural light. Ensure lights are turned off in unoccupied areas and ensure external signage and security lighting is turned off during the day. Replacing your lighting system is a little more costly and time consuming and should only be considered once you've reduced your lighting needs. If you do decide to install a new system, you have some options. Replace incandescent halogen bulbs with equivalent LED bulbs. Replace T8 fluorescent tubes with T5 fluorescent tubes and install dimmers. Changing your lighting is a good way to reduce costs However, before you do, consult an external lighting contractor just to make sure that you get the right system for your business. And it's strongly recommended that you undertake a trial to make sure it has the right colour and feel and works for the various areas of your pub or hotel. Let's take a look at another case study, the Rendezvous Grand Hotel in Adelaide. After an audit, they found they could make significant savings by upgrading their lighting. Although they knew an LED replacement program would be expensive at first, they decided it was worth it because those costs would be offset by reduced maintenance and replacement needs. Did you know LED lights last 50 times longer than standard halogen lamps? The hotel spent $120,000. It saved 169,500 kilowatt hours per year, or more than $15,000 a year, and had a payback period of 7.8 years. Stay online to continue through the presentation where we'll be discussing the other guides as part of this program. 
looking at how and when you use energy in other areas within your building could also lead to significant savings. Take the time to assess the following areas. Kitchens, hot water heating systems, cellars, cold stores and refrigeration systems, pools, spas and gyms, and lifts, escalators and laundries. There are two key opportunities to reduce the energy cost of equipment. When it's being used, and when new or replacement equipment is being purchased. Download the guide to other equipment energy efficiencies to find out more. You can make energy saving changes when renovating or refurbishing. Consider the following elements in the design phase. Building orientation and fabric, layout of functional areas and types of equipment. Remember, the cost of operating a piece of equipment over its life far exceeds the cost of paying for it in the first place. Download the renovation and refurbishment guide now to find out more. Energy efficiency is just one aspect of broader resource efficiency, which is the efficient use and reuse of all resources across the supply chain. So that's all your materials, water and energy. There are several important parts to your supply chain, and as a hotel or pub, you can start to make it more efficient by changing four areas of your business. Make your purchasing processes more sustainable and resource efficient, alongside other value for money considerations like price, quality and service. Ensure your staff are aware of how their operating decisions affect the overall resources used by your business. Encourage guests, staff and contractors to use alternative forms of transport that have a lower impact, like trains, trams, bikes and walking. And finally, improve your waste management performance by reducing overall waste generation and increasing the proportion of your waste that gets reused or recycled. The Alto Hotel in Melbourne has changed the way they supply liquid toiletries. They've eliminated individual plastic toiletry bottles and replaced them with refillable pump action dispensers. The switch has saved the hotel money and led to a reduction in waste generation and waste management costs. If you want to find out more, download the Guide to Resource Use and the Supply Chain from this website. Otherwise, stay online for the Energy Efficiency Induction Manual. Properly engaging your staff and contractors is a key part of energy efficiency in your hotel or pub, and a great way of doing that is through the Energy Efficiency Induction Manual. The manual's been structured to be tailored to the needs of your business. It outlines policies, procedures and accreditations that can be applied to your business. It encourages staff to use the energy efficiency guides. It details roles and responsibilities and engagement strategies to help you achieve your goals and it provides you with checklists to empower staff and contractors to be more accountable and play their part in reducing energy use in their areas. In concluding this presentation, we've introduced you to a wide range of material available on the AHA Energy Efficiency website. We encourage you to download and use the guides and induction manual. A good place to start would be to establish an energy management system as outlined in the Energy Efficiency and Business Planning Guide. The material has been developed to be read in sequence, but it can be used on an as-needs basis. For example, if you only wanted to concentrate on lighting at first, that's fine, just download that guide. Each guide references other material where relevant and has been structured to help you realise the importance of guest and patron participation. Thank you for taking part in this presentation. Should you require any further information, please visit the Energy Efficiency website, www.aha.org.au energy, or simply contact your membership officer.